Thank you, Jonathan. This new year, I was at a remote, dilapidated camp in the middle of no man's land on the Lebanon-Syria border with 600 Syrian refugee children. There were girls there much younger than me carrying their babies. They had forgotten how, what it was like to be in a classroom because they just didn't, it was so long ago and they didn't even remember their last decent meal. Their shell-shocked faces were devoid of emotion. And what shocked me the most was that even though they were children, they had forgotten how to smile. Over the next couple of days, I engaged with these children by conducting workshops on environmental conservation by the end of which I had a raucous bunch of laughing children eager to plant trees and conduct a waste cleanup in their camp. The biggest reward for me at the end of this activity was their smiles, something which they had lost because of the cruel travails of war thrust upon them by their uncaring leaders. Leaders who spend billions on weapons of mass destruction and building nuclear stockpiles, yet hesitate to spend a few dollars that could provide bread, shelter, and access to education for these hapless children who now live a life knowing not what tomorrow holds for them. Incidentally, these 600 children did not have any IDs or documentation. So for all official purposes, they do not exist. A year earlier, I was at the Baby Life Home, an orphanage for HIV positive children. There were children younger than six over there, abandoned by their parents, who were too poor to afford the costly drugs and hospital bills. During my workshops, these little angels eagerly discussed how they would plant trees that would grow tall and provide shade to their ramshackle home, not knowing that they would not be alive to see it happen. I am 18 years old, and as we discuss the fate of humanity within these comfortable, cozy walls, 168 million of my brothers and sisters are out there in the cold or oppressive heat rummaging through garbage piles or begging on the streets or working in some sweatshop to eke out a living. Yes, 168 million. That's the official number of children worldwide trapped in child labor, many of them girls much younger than me. Every second, a person dies of hunger, while at the same time, 900 million tons of food is wasted in the developed world, enough to feed the entire population of sub-Saharan Africa for a year. And yet the nuclear armed states continue to spend billions, now trillions of dollars, on building nuclear stockpiles and weapons of mass destruction which is effectively threatening the current and future generations and violating the right of children to a peaceful and non-irradiated planet. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the planet that I am growing up in. Our world today has the highest number of refugees since World War II, and that number keeps growing at an alarming rate. All our technological advancements will be for naught if they do not benefit the masses. The urgent need of the day is education, reform, and healthcare. We need peace and stability, and not some false sense of security that some nations are thrusting upon their citizens by building a garrison of nuclear weapons. Of greater risk is the possibility of there being nuclear theft, accident, and terrorism. 
As was mentioned earlier, 35 years ago, a catastrophic nuclear conflict was averted because one alert individual turned a system-generated signal as a false alarm. Systems can fail, and of greater concern is the fact that there is a theoretical possibility that they can be hacked into. And if this happens, then it's virtually curtains for all of us. Much as we would like it, we can't undo the hydrogen bomb. However, we can stop the additional spending and reduce nuclear stockpiles because what these nations have and carry with them is enough to destroy our beautiful planet many times over. As Carl Sagan eulogized, the nuclear arms race is like two sworn enemies standing waist deep in gasoline, one with three matches, the other with five. A nuclear zero world is like a mountain whose peak is not yet visible to us. So the need of the day is to possibly move to a higher base camp where the peak is visible to all. And attaining that higher base camp is all about knowledge dissemination. A large majority of civil society, including us, children and youth, have limited awareness and data about the level of nuclear stockpiles, the amounts that get spent every year, and what safety measures are in place. The truth must be laid there, for it is not security, but the balance sheets of the nuclear arms industries that's fueling this arms race. And this must stop. We, the children and youth, have a major role to play in demanding accountability from these industries and the leaders who patronize them to disclose why billions of dollars are being spent to enrich more plutonium while our homeless are dying on the streets, when drugs are decimating our youth, when school dropout levels continue to rise, and our cities turning into veritable gas chambers from the exhausts of millions of vehicles out there. The implementation of Article 26 of the UN Charter in letter and in spirit has never been more important and is the need of the day. The unbridled spending on arms, in particular the $100 billion global nuclear weapons budget, should be redirected towards reducing poverty, reversing climate change, protecting our oceans, building a sustainable economy, providing access to education and healthcare for all of humanity. And there needs to be complete transparency on this spending, and this is where we, the youth, have a great role to play. We must, as one voice, demand that these leaders, who ostensibly represent us, pay heed to our needs of education, employment, and a clean, pollutant-free environment. We need to accelerate the dialogue with parliamentarians and our lawmakers to stop this profligate spending and instead channelize funds and resources to saving lives and alleviating the suffering of millions around the world. Each and every one of us, all of us, we suffer from selective myopia. If this weren't the case, then we would see the red blood droplets on our white salt on our dinner tables. 70% of the salt in the Indian subcontinent comes from the arid salt pans of the Thar Desert in the run of Kutch, harvested by members of the Agaria tribe, who've lived there for centuries and know only one means of livelihood, salt production. They harvest the salt with their bare hands 
and walk bare feet across the corrosive salt water. None of them wear shoes, and the air that they breathe in, the salt-laden air, ensures that most of them do not live beyond the age of 40. Working on a project there to distribute solar lamps and shoes to the Agaria children, I was shocked to learn that one in four of those children did not live to their teens. And what does all this labor get them? One dollar for one ton of salt produced. The pitiable plight of the Agarias never gets talked about. And yet, most of civil society continues to be swayed by the rhetoric of these leaders who exploit the fear psychosis and conspiracy theories to waste billions on weapons of mass destruction, while thousands of children, like those in the salt marshes of the Kutch, die slow deaths while mining salt for our tables. If we are to see change happen, it has to begin with us. That is my belief, and even though I am 18, I believe that my actions, no matter how small and insignificant in the global scale of things, will help to alleviate the suffering of at least a few. As C.S. Lewis once said, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start right here and change the ending. Thank you.